Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and macabre murders from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 98! 98! But most importantly, it's bloody February! It's bloody February? And what What does that mean, I wonder? It's to end dry January, Nick! It was end dry January several weeks ago, wasn't it? Stop really? saying that! <laughs> Let me have this moment. Yay! Everyone who has been doing dry January, it's over. I managed quite a bit of January dry, I, which was good for me. Yeah, I did finish a little bit early, people. Don't judge me. But yes, we have officially finished dry January. It doesn't mean that we won't do non-alcoholic cocktails on the show in the future. So if you are interested in them or you still want recommendations of them, do message us. Otherwise, it's just relentless drinking, which we all know that's what you're really here for. Yeah, how are you, Nick? I'm alright. <laughs> you're like, raring to go this I week. I am. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's been a mad week. You've been. You're full of spirits. Oh, I'm full <laughs> of bordering on hysteria and exhaustion. Yes, <laughs> that's what that is. That's what that is. And taking into account the Negroni I've just had as well, I'm ready to go. <laughs> and you're in your comfy trousers as well. In my comfy trousers. <laughs> Thanks for that. Thanks for letting everyone know I'm in my comfy trousers. You let me know when I came in. You were like, yeah, look at my comfy trousers. That's different. <laughs> I think people who are listening expect us to be here in entire formal attire. We're still wearing top hats. <laughs> I mean, the top, top hats, hats... waistcoat, bow tie, comfy trousers. Exactly. The top uh, hats are mandatory on the Poisoner's I Cabinet. I was say, yeah. Any poisonings this week? Oh, God, who knows? Oh. It's just it's been a blur. It's been a blur. Ooh, right. In the in the fancy furniture shop. In the fancy furniture shop. Cabinet I of curiosities. Left my office for three days. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> you sort of open the door and it's World War Three exactly. out there. It could be. Well, it will be soon. But it could be. It could well be there out there now. The sofas have taken over. The sofas have taken over. <laughs> Sofas are taken over the asylum. It's but do you right. imagine, are there many sofas in asylums? I mean, that's nice if there were. I think a modicum of sofa rich. In modern asylums, yes. <laughs> Not the kind of asylums we usually deal with. No, that's mainly spikes. It's mainly <laughs> spike-based, Well, speaking of asylums and sitting on spikes, I think it's time for us to thank our delicious Patreon subscribers. Absolutely, they love a spike. So thank you very much to Robert Kane. And Kush Chatterpotterhay. Possibly. Oh, there we are. And? And Lauren Lidlow Morgan. You have a much easier name. The people with the most complicated names are the best Patreon right. subscribers. You are all delicious, very, very sexy. As we've always said, make up any old shit and your names basically on Patreon. We've got to oh, read right. them out. Make them interesting for yeah, us. Absolutely. <laughs> Send us weird shout outs. Well, you could be lying. It's fine. <laughs> You'd have to do them. Well, Nick, are you ready? Yes. Yes, I am. To drink cocktails and talk about poison? I am. Because you're going to have a cocktail well this week. Oh, my God. That's exciting. Or, I mean, we could drink poison and talk about cocktails, but that doesn't sound no, as much that's, fun. That's nowhere near as much fun. No. Should we have cocktails? Should we have cocktails, Should Nick? we have cocktails? We... For the first time since December. <laughs> Woohoo! A Nick-made cocktail. First time since December that Nick has made me a cocktail. And you usually make me one twice a day. Yeah, pretty much. We don't even live together. <laughs> no, I just arrive at your office, cocktail in hand. <laughs> yes, I have a wonderful job. And people think I am very, very fancy friends. Turn up in top hats and comfy trousers with cocktails. I'm very fancy. Okay, we're going to go with the first one. Hooray, hooray, hooray. Because as you know, we can't, we can't, we can't possibly have a story without a cocktail in hand. As you know, dear listeners, every week we choose a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell that will flavour a cocktail of the week. Nick's story this week, so it's his pick. Now, Nick, this was, oh my God, this was a tricky one. I mean, how <laughs> you were going to make a cocktail out of this secret ingredient, God it's only been knows. A I mean, I've been weeks mm. researching this. Yeah. Hours upon hours Googling, trying to find something Indeed. that would be appropriate for this ingredient. Well, the secret ingredient, Nick, is? Uh, I mean, I, um, I feel it's cheating. I feel it's lacking adventure and <laughs> ambition. Okay. But it's rum. White rum. White, we have, yes, okay, white rum. White we rum, must we... must be specific. We haven't done white rum yet. So that's fine. That's okay. <laughs> Don't criticise yourself. I'm surprised you're criticising yourself. Usually it's me. <laughs> this is true. This yeah. is true. White rum. We haven't done white rum yet. And every now and then we like to throw in a spirit because it's appropriate for the story. And you know what? Let's have a party. And it's also the first week back where I can have cocktails with you. So it's nice that... It's probably not going to be an awful cocktail, I'm hoping. Well, I don't know. There are a lot of rum-based cocktails out there, some of which are dreadful. I'm hoping you've chosen a nice well, one. Yeah, we'll find out, won't we? What possibly could you have come well, up with? there are... I found one or two options out there. Surely when not. When I googled rum cocktails, a couple of things came up, it had to be said. But I thought, I don't want a daiquiri. 
like a daiquiri, tasty, yum, yum, yum. The jammy daiquiri last jammy week. Da- the Who Lives Here. The Who Lives Here was a big hit. Lots of people yeah. making it. It was good. It was, it good was. yeah. I didn't even bloody get to taste much of it. <laughs> but I thought, no, I don't want to do a daiquiri. Everyone does a daiquiri. That's boring. Oh, mojito. Everyone does a mojito. Yeah, no, mojito. Dull, everyone. No. I'm, I'm going to just put it out there. I'm not a massive fan yeah. of the mojito. So, mm. I'm doing something a bit different this week. Okay. We're going to have an angel's draft. <laughs> an angel's, an draft. angel's draft. Oh, I have I have images in my I head. I like this name. It is a very good name. Good angel's name. draft is in like it could be a draft of beer, an angel in an old timey pub. I'm picturing it, pouring a pint. So I was more going like an angel has drifted past and created a draft of wind behind you. <laughs> Oh, I was not thinking so that. So no, you, no, you were thinking, give me a beer. Well, the second thing I was thinking of is like a draftsman, then an angel just designing stuff on a big bit of paper. Right. <laughs> it's a draft layout for a new type of angel. Right, okay. That it's drawn. Plans of how to make it God. <laughs> what could the angel be drafting? Nothing. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, you have just a waft of air as yes. the angel walked by. Oh, that's an angel's draft. It's a exactly. bit breezy and it went... Ah. It's a shiver on the neck. It's a, it's a oh, sort of moment. <laughs> an angel's draft. Yeah. I can't believe you went for the wind version. I don't know what's going on. Shut up. Moving on, moving on. That could be a nicer version of the shiver you get when you say someone's walking over my grave. You can yeah. go, oh, it's an angel's draft. An angel has just passed by. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Drafting. Drafting. A picture of with, a, with a With a big pad. <laughs> <laughs> I lost it once to the king. I have many designs to share. Okay, so the angel is drafting stuff and has made a draft and has a draft of beer in hand. Wonderful. The possibilities, the possibilities are endless, are endless. <laughs> Oh, I'm so excited for this. I'm not sure you should have one anymore. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no, no. I have to. 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 It's February. <laughs> February must be damp. Drafty. <laughs> I'm from drafty. I would like our February's. Okay, before we go into any more metaphors about what this angel has been up to, I think it is high time for us to go into the poisonous cabinet kitchen and shake up a storm. So we'll see you in a minute. We'll see you in a bit. And we're back. Hello. Oh, Nick, the first cocktail of February. And it's very pretty. It's very, very pretty. pretty. It's not as foamy as I would have hoped. So it is a golden-hued one. Mm. Not not quite golden, more, I don't know, more yellow? More yellowy. Got a yellowy twang. More yellow, it. but it has got a foamy head. It has. Like a draft of beer, almost. <laughs> like, like a, exactly like a draft of beer. And it is garnet adorned, <laughs> shall we say, with two little leaves. Leaves. Uh, shall I venture of the mint variety? Well done. Yes, well done. <laughs> with your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> That might give a hint of one of the ingredients, but it looks very pretty. Ooh, wow. exciting. And white rum. Oh, one, I'm so happy. I assume there's white rum in it. <laughs> if there's not, then what have you done? You'll find out, won't you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you would think I'd put white rum in it, but fuck you. No. Is it almost... Yours is kind of greeny. Is it uh, yellowy It's green? just different. No, it's exactly the same. No, it is sort of yellowy. Oh, okay, right. Okay, so a little sniff. Oh, no. oh okay, nice. Okay, well, let's dive in. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yay. Ooh. Oh, ho, 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 Nick, welcome home to me. You could have given me anything and I'd be going, yes. <laughs> oh, that, well, that's nice. That's got citrusy. It's sharp. Nice mouthfeel mm. to it, which may be hinting at the foaminess. Hmm. I can't place all of the flavours, though. No. But do you like it? I do like that. I'm glad. That is really nice. It tastes, I mean, I've got to be honest, it tastes like a good daiquiri. In a way, but... It has, it has a similar vibe to it. It has a similar vibe. Okay, well, talk us through it. What, okay. what's, what's going on here? What, what's, going <laughs> what's going on? on here? So, we have rum. Yes, we do have rum. We do have There's white rum. There's some rum. <laughs> right. going good, on good, good, good. We're well on the way. Yeah, we have lime. Yes, that's so a good that's friend lime. So that's where your daiquiri twang is coming from. Okay, right, right, right. There's some agave in there for Ooh. a hint of sweetness. So that's, that's your classic daiquiri. But we have some grapefruit bitters. Ooh, okay. A dash of grapefruit in there. Then, yes, we have some mint. We have some shaken with some mint as well. So okay. A mintiness going there. Egg whites, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Gives mm-hmm. us a foamy head. And a drop of your favourite ingredient. Has it got fucking chartreuse in Some it? lovely, lovely chartreuse. No! But it has yellow chartreuse. Yellow Not green, chartreuse. Oh, has the yellow no. chartreuse. Um, oh, which is a bit God. milder, a bit less pungent than the green. 
Um, but you said you liked it. You said you liked it. You said you liked it. <laughs> I should have known better. I'm just someone who just keeps going back to the same mistakes. <laughs> too trusting. Too trusting. Earlier when we looked at it, it was like yellow. And I was like, the little voice in my head went, he hasn't put yellow chartreuse in this. He wouldn't be so cruel. It sadly gets a look out the yellow chartreuse in there. Cannot taste the horribleness I, that I normally associate. You will notice if it was not there. You always say that. I, I would notice that. if it was There's not a there. There's reason that, that these things are in there. There's no point just chucking everything in. That's a good point. What no. would I? What would I be missing? We were missing loveliness. <laughs> Some herbal complexity okay. in the background, an yeah. additional bit of sweetness, a different sweetness to the agave. I had no idea there was any chartreuse in it. I did not get some big hit of herbally woeness, no. which you do get with a green chartreuse. Yeah, it depends on what cocktail you're drinking. Yep. You've you've made me a yellow chartreuse drink before, and I did nearly throw up and throw it in your face. But it was it had a lot. That more. that was that was that's a very different. That one. was a very different one. Whatever it's doing, it works because as as I've said, I'm not normally these days a fan of a lot of mint. In yes, a drink, yes, yes. I'm getting just enough mint. Yeah, it's not overpowering. Nothing in there is overpowering. Nicely balanced, and it's exactly what you want. It's, it's exactly what you white need. White rum, cocktail. citrusy, bit of herbal in there. I'll give you that. <laughs> I'll give you that. I'm gonna will. have a third sip. And now you hate it. <laughs> uh, ew. That is a winner. One other, two other chartreuse cocktails you've made. You've maybe one where I didn't mind it and one that I liked it. But the other one that I liked had so much mezcal in it. That I was, <laughs> That's true, and yes. also I'd had four cocktails that day and I was like, ah, this is Always lovely. Always with the excuses. <laughs> I'm going to venture that, yes, it's the most sophisticated. And you're absolutely right, Nick, that if it wasn't in there, I'd probably be missing something. And I don't know what it is. But it's something. I wouldn't know. It's an angel. That's what it is. Just as the faintest hint of it, like an angel's draft as it passes through a room. Exactly. Or it's making plans for world domination while drinking yellow chartreuse. Uh, well, I am pleased and I think it's brilliant. Hurrah. Well done you, Nick. Well done me. Well done you. I'm you found you a it. use for chartreuse. This is a good example you, you, of it, people. You and your rhyming ways. I know. <laughs> I mean, it just came to me. It does came to me. Well, with the angel's draft firmly in hand, if such a thing is possible, is it time for a story, Nick? It certainly is time for a story. Hooray! Hooray, hooray, I have a cocktail. Nick's going to tell me a story. Life is good. It's a jolly time. So this week we are taking a trip down under. Yay! To the lovely, lovely little town of Berima. Uh, I'm probably uh. pronouncing that horrendously wrong. It's located about 130 kilometres to the south of Sydney in Australia. <laughs> no. Well, just in case, just in case, I thought I'd put it out there. If you say down under and then you went, ah, Fiji. I was like, oh, okay. So it is quite a little town. It's a little town. Even yeah. now, it has a population of around 600 people. That's right. Um, and in the 1840s, it is half that. I'm looking around 250 to 300, something like that. But despite its small size, it is a town that is full of history. Now it's full of quaint little tea shops, um, antique and craft stores. Oh. There is a town museum and an old courthouse. It has Australia's oldest hotel. Okay. The Surveyor General. That's a great name for yeah, a hotel. It was on like the stop off, but you would stop there after a, after a day or so, a couple of days traveling out of Sydney. Yeah. Um, it's somewhere you would stop for a night, rest, and then continue your journey onwards. That's how hotels work. Well, that's how hotels work. Like. <laughs> <Back up. laughs> that sounds delightful. We would love it there. Yeah. A tea shop or a museum. Yeah. Less lovely. Less lovely. It's also home to Australia's worst serial killer. Even more reason why we would love it. <laughs> Tea shop, museum, hotel, serial killer. Let us settle in for the night, I don't people. I think he's still there. Oh, his ghost haunts. <laughs> yes, a chap called John Lynch. <laughs> Good name. Good name. Good name okay. for a serial killer. The horrors of John Lynch start to come to light on the morning of the 19th of February, 1841, okay. when Hugh Tinney, a drover on his way to Sydney with his cattle, um, stops near Ironstone Bridge, just outside Barima, and notices a dingo rummaging around a pile of brush. A very Australian scene, I feel. <laughs> Everyone stop sniggering. He was rummaging around a pile of shrub, um, trying to find whatever was inside. No doubt, lots of babies. <laughs> Hugh goes to see what the animal has found, expecting to see it a sheep or some babies or some such. Um, okay. <laughs> but he does not find any of those things. Instead, he clears his way through the undergrowth to reveal the body of a young man no. with a gaping wound in the back of his head. Ugh. Now, this man is lying on his back and he has got a fixed smile on his face, thinking that he hadn't seen what was coming. He, he didn't know what had hit him. He died smiling. He, he, had a, he was smiling and then all of a sudden he get whacked in the back of the head. He's dead before he knows it. Is that possible? Well, it seems to be. 
I mean, he was obviously very happy. He was. He was happy. He was having a jolly time. Whoever killed him yeah. told him a lovely joke. And a he lovely was, he joke. He died laughing. He died laughing. He died having a happy time. There was a smile on his face. Did he no, die laughing and then his brain exploded because it was so funny? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's what happened. Okay. This man, John Lynch, is actually the funniest man <laughs> in the history of the world. He killed people through laughter. Okay. You've solved it. People's heads exploded with joy. <laughs> Now, Hugh runs into the town of Barima to report his discovery, um, and soon the town sheriff was on site, and he quickly identifies this young lad as local farmhand Terence Landrigan. After some asking around the town, they discover that Terence had last been seen at the Woolpack Inn with another local man named John Dunleavy. Now, Dunleavy is relatively new to the area. He had purchased a farm the year before from the Mulligan family, who had apparently left town rapidly one day, supposedly to avoid being investigated for selling illegal alcohol. Oh, right. They had scarpered Dunleavy had taken over the farm. Now, when the authorities pay a visit to Dunleavy to, to find out what he knew when he had last seen uh, this young lad, they discovered him wearing a shirt covered in blood and Terence Landrigan's hat upon his head. Bold. A bold okay. it's, a, it's a bold move. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bold look. Now, he's unsurprisingly a person of interest. Shocking. <laughs> to, Shocking. To, to the crime. And he, he hadn't changed. He hadn't changed, apparently. No, no. They, apparently they, they, the, the authorities disturb him at sleep so it was obviously he it happened at night he had got home and he was drunk um but he was asleep lying in his bed bleh, blood covered shirt hat he had sort of passed off. out or what have you he took his hat and we're like look at me i'm this person <laughs> la 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 and then fell asleep after dancing fell asleep, all night. Fell asleep. everyone's smiling he's taken in for questioning yes. and when they get him under lock and key and they do a bit of digging they discover that the man they know as john dunleavy is not john dunleavy <gasps> he is in fact john lynch a former convict and a man who has been suspected of all sorts of shenanigans in the past, but nothing has ever stuck. Mm. Now, after his incarceration, his questioning, John strongly protests his innocence. He has done nothing wrong at all. But as the authorities start probing, start trying to find out his history, what they discover will shock the entire country. <laughs> it's a dreadful time He's for a been- drink. Taking people's hats all over Australia. People's heads exploding throughout the land. (laughs) John Lynch is born in County Cavan in Ireland in 1813. Mm -hmm. Now, I know we often say that not much is known about his childhood. um, But in this case, it is actually nothing at all. Uh, We know he was born in 1813. The next thing we hear that he has been sentenced to transportation to Australia. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was a bad childhood. It was a bad childhood. Something went very wrong in those <laughs> intervening years. But he has been sentenced for the crime of receiving goods under false pretenses. So some sort oh. of fraudulent oh, so con activities going on there. Okay. Now, some other reports um, or later versions of events say that this crime has in fact involved the death of his father uh, but if that were the case it was more likely he would have received a death sentence rather mm. than transportation so that's probably all bollocks or is he impersonating um, his father we don't know now we aren't even sure when he arrived in australia conflicting reports put him on either the ship the asia in 1831 the donovan castle in 32 or potentially the java in 33 one of those three he was on but whichever he was on when he arrived he was bound to seven years of servitude after which once he'd done his sentence he would be free to travel about Mm -hmm. settle in australia or return home if he could afford the fare now as a convict laborer he was shifted from farm to farm as he was needed and in 1836 he is laboring on a farm named oldbury in argyle that is run by a man named george barton Um, now george barton is not a pleasant man he is a violent alcoholic um, who is horrendous to all his convict labourers. He will eventually go on to be convicted of manslaughter years later, just to show you what the type of person he is. Mm. Uh, But for now, he is a violent disciplinarian and hated by every worker on the farm. One day, Burton is returning to the farm from a business travels when he is held up on the road by a masked gang who rob him of everything he is carrying before tying him to a fence post and flogging him, leaving him there to be found by the next passerby. When Barton eventually escapes his tying up on a fence, he reports his assault to the authorities and suspicion immediately falls on these indentured labourers. A man named Watt is captured and executed for this crime. His name is Watt. What? Exactly. Absolutely. Let's move on. Let's acknowledge it. Let's move on. It's all very, very funny. (laughs) 
But rumours around Albury have it that it was not Watt who was responsible, but it was John Lynch. He had been one of the masked men, and it was him who had inflicted this flogging um, as a revenge for a punishment he himself had received on the farm. Now, when another labourer, Thomas Smith, is arrested for stealing a saddle, but then is somewhat <laughs> suspiciously released without charge, the general opinion is that well, he must have cut a deal. He's said something to avoid punishment. Okay. Um, and the assumption is that he has given up names of the other men in this gang to avoid yeah, retribution for his saddle thieving. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> now, after these rumours get out, it does not take long for Thomas Smith to turn up dead. No really? one likes a graph. And also, what are you going to get for stealing a saddle? I mean, they're Probably quite pricey, much. I guess. They're but... pricey, but yeah, well, you do. You know, then steal a horse and ride away, or... <laughs> it's a can't... gateway crime. <laughs> it is a gateway crime, absolutely. <laughs> if you're in that kind of game, you don't mm, dub on your friends. Yeah, don't dub on your mates. Absolutely. It's a very good deal, clearly. Well, indeed. Now, Lynch is an immediate suspect for this murder. There, in fact, is a witness to this, a man named Michael Hoy, who claims that Lynch and another chap, John Williamson, have persuaded Smith to accompany them out of the labourer's hut, and into the farm, but later returned alone and covered in blood. I'm seeing a, a theme, There's a theme here, isn't going it? on there, but they were saying that Smith had been put in a place where he could say no more. Wow. Nice. That's very mobster It's very mobster And it also seems to be fairly damning evidence against, I mean, much. against Lynch. That and the blood. Uh, that and the blood. And so it goes trial with Michael Hoy as a witness um, against Lynch. Not the brightest bulb, I'm thinking. Well, at trial, Lynch defends himself, and he manages to create sufficient uncertainty about Hoy's account to create doubt. George Barton, farm manager, himself is called to testify, but his evidence is in fact rejected by the judge, as he is completely off his face in the witness stand. <laughs> <laughs> Pissed out of his brain, he is trying to give evidence for his own assault. He was a big man. He was a big, he was a big man. fella. A shock of hair, red like the fires of hell. And there was a flogging, and it was great. No, I mean it was horrible. And there were fifteen of them, and there was a woman, and she came and she gave me a cheese sandwich. That's exactly how it was. I mean, I've got the transcript here. It was pretty much word, word for word. Lynch claims that well, Michael Hoy has had just as much motive as he did to get rid of Thomas Smith. Mm. Michael Hoy is a convict himself, a, a labourer there, so he yeah. is he is not exactly a, an angel, um, a reliable witness. Yeah, um, he's, he's dobbing others in. There's no honour amongst thieves. Well, indeed. And in fact, the judge, when he's summing up, refers to Hoy as a person tainted with crime and therefore liable to suspicion. Uh-huh. Indicating, can we really take his testimony to be true? He's a known wrong'un. Lynch <laughs> is found not guilty. Ah. And he is released back to finish his sentence on a different farm. Okay. Now, in 1841, John Lynch is granted his certificate of freedom. He has served his time and he is now a free man to do with it as he pleased. Um, <laughs> Go, roam our country! Have at it! The first thing he did was steal some cows. Yay! <laughs> the day he left the farm. The day the he left, he stole the cows from the farm. But really? Yes. Oh, God! <laughs> like, you're a free man. These are mine! These are mine now. <laughs> <laughs> Flipping the Vs as he's going. Like, yeah. Can we get him on that? It's still bloody theft. <laughs> Chase him down. No, he is a free man. He's a free man. These are his cows. He stole eight bullocks. Eight bullocks. Eight bullocks. And okay. he tried to sell these cattle to John Mulligan. Ah, uh, Mulligan. Now, now, Mulligan was an ex-convict. He had previously used to, to fence stolen goods. Yeah, he is known as a bit of a known fence. Uh, but Mulligan refuses to offer him what he thinks is a fair price. Mm. So instead, he sets off to Sydney to sell his ill-gotten cattle. Riding into Sydney. Riding into Sydney. Eight bullocks. <laughs> now, Eight on... <laughs> bullocks. That's, that's a not a good ride. <laughs> They're doing what they're told. They're meandering along the road to Sydney. It's just him driving oh. eight cattle. Yeah. I don't know. I've never driven cattle. Oh, yeah, me exactly. Oh, cowboy Sinead over there. <laughs> <laughs> what do you see these pictures of these great herds of cow going across? There's they don't hundreds. have like. Yeah, exactly. They don't have one cowboy per cow, do they? <laughs> <laughs> That's how I'd do it. <laughs> Give the cow a massage half the way through. <laughs> Polish its horns. It's had a hard day. Every, every cow's got its own rider. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, that's why my cattle rustling business did not do so well. I overstaffed. <laughs> Now, on the road, on the road, he meets a chap named Edmund Ireland and his helper, a young Aboriginal boy, um, who we do not know the name of, unfortunately, okay. but a young lad who is assisting Edmund in his duties. Now, the pair were taking a wagon load of produce from Bungandor to Sydney. 
Mm. It's a trip of 170 miles in total. Mm. So a good old stretch. Um, they are doing this on behalf of Ireland's employer, a chap named Thomas Cowper. Now, when the two men met, they get talking and they get on like a house on fire. They are they discover they are both heading to the same place and they decide to travel together for safety. There are some Ooh. dangerous people out there, you know. And now, Edmund Ireland, I thought he would certainly reg- come to regret his decisions to yeah. team up with John Lynch. Now, one evening as they settle down for the night, Lynch determines that it will be much easier and probably much more profitable for him to simply take this wagon load of supplies from the unsuspecting island. These bullocks, they're, they're a lot of work. <laughs> it's, a one it's man. Bullocks, they're, they're a pain to deal with. They need food and water, a simple horse and wagon. That's, that's much simpler. Yeah. He's got lots of stuff in his wagon. There's grain and bacon and meats and things, all sorts of things that he's selling in Sydney. Worth probably a bit more. As he comes up with this plan, he decides to ask God what he should do. He's a a religious man. He decides to have a chat with God. What is the best plan on this? Okay, that's a curveball I wasn't expecting. Yeah, yeah. Now, as as Thomas Lynch concludes that, well, God didn't directly tell him not to at that moment. Um, He didn't actively (laughs) put a stop to this plan that he was forming. He was absolutely fine with it, obviously. God would be fine with it. And he's cleared to go ahead and take these goods from Ireland and his young helper. So was he praying, saying, my intention is to take these goods from this man, steal them. If you agree with me, give me absolutely no response. They will be done. Yes. Off he goes. We're pretty much there, yes. <laughs> if you think this is a bad idea, then you try and stop me. And nothing <laughs> happened. He went, well, God's on my side. Now, so the next morning, are. Lynch asked Edmund's young assistant to help him get the cattle ready to set off. As the pair head into the sort of field to round up the animals, uh, Lynch creeps up behind him no. and smashes the lad in the back of the head with his tomahawk. Oh! All it needed to kill him, Lynch said, was just one tap with a tomahawk. He dropped like a log of wood. Now, Lynch returned to the camp to find Ireland preparing breakfast for the for the trio. Oh, lovely. He explained that the boy had gone looking for the, some missing bullocks and that they should eat without him. He'll be back when he's found these animals. Oh, that's cool. Uh, now, when Ireland is about to serve breakfast and his back is turned, uh. Lynch cracked his head open with the tomahawk and Edmund Ireland crumples to the floor. He just wanted the extra bacon. Well, indeed, he now sits down and eats a break- breakfast for three. Um, <laughs> it's very, very toasty. Before dragging both bodies to a cleft between two rocks and covering them with brush and stones and twigs and things to disguise this crime. Now, Lynch is now entirely convinced that God is definitely looking out for him. He hasn't. St- he's killed two people. God has not stopped him. Therefore, there is, God is fine with it. There has been zero lightning bolts there from the been sky. There zero lightning but zero booming voices going, no, don't do that. No burning bushes. Uh, no burning bushes. So go for it. Have at it. <laughs> so he is in no hurry to get away. He remains at the camp for two days, sort of going through his new supplies, seeing what he's now obtained, having a nice bit of bacon. On the second day, he is joined by two men who are passing by and travelling. Two chaps called Lag and Lee. Don't know their first names, but two chaps, Lag and Lee, who are travelling with a team of horses, also on their way towards Sydney. A double act if ever there Yeah, was well, the, the trio, they ate and they drank and they sang and they have a very jolly evening. Okay. Um, the men even performing an Irish jig for <laughs> Lynch's entertainment. Um... <laughs> Are well, they just like a travelling pair yeah, of, uh, trying to start their own vaudeville act? Yeah, absolutely. They're having a great time. But uh, thank God they did, because this is the only reason why the two men didn't end up with a tomahawk to the head. Because they had been jolly and entertaining and funny, and Lynch had had a nice evening. If ever in doubt, just do a bit of Irish dancing. It ever keeps everyone happy. Yeah, <laughs> now, on the third day, he decides to continue his trip to Sydney to sell his ill-gotten gaze. Lag and Lee join him for the journey, unaware of how close they had come to ending up in a ditch. As Lynch approaches Sydney, his luck changes slightly. On the trail heading into the city, he encounters Thomas Cowper, <gasps> the man who had hired Edmund Island to drive the wagon Ooh, yes. in the first place. Now, Thomas <laughs> recognises his wagon and horses and asks what the hell is Lynch doing with his stuff and where is Edmund, yeah. um, who has been paid to bring this stuff in. Now, Lynch he's, thinks on his feet. He's, he's got a quick brain. And he explains Island is very ill. He's very, very unwell. He, we left him at the camp some miles back. And mm-hmm. in fact, Ireland had given him a few coins to continue the trip. Without him, he knew that the goods had to get to Sydney. It was mm. very important from his employer. Now, right. Kappa is incredibly grateful that but Lynch no has one... taken on this responsibility to bring his goods to Sydney. No one's questioning No this. one's questioning He doesn't give a shit, no, does he? No, absolutely. <laughs> uh, he's even more grateful when Lynch agrees to continue on to, continue on to Sydney. We, they agree to meet up in a couple of days while Kappa goes, actually, and goes to try and find 
Ireland. Go and find him, see if you can help him. We'll meet back in Sydney in a few days. As he continues on to Sydney, Lynch thanks God for getting him through another close call. <laughs> Obviously, this is God who has done this, has put these ideas in his brain. The Lord is on his side. Mm. But the Lord didn't tell him to just to blurt out, I killed him with a tomahawk. No, 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 Damn, no. God wanted me to confess. No, absolutely not. God does not want that. God mm. wants Lynch to continue and succeed. Now, of course, Lynch never turns up for his meeting with Cowper. He has raced ahead into the city to sell Cowper's stock as fast as possible, needing to get away before Cowper comes back into the town, potentially with Edmund Island's body in tow, <laughs> if, if he finds it. But dragging it behind well, him on a horse. If, if this <laughs> poor man was left to die in the brush, I've dragged him for a hundred miles. Now, well, me, you probably didn't need to, mate. some sort of cart or something may have been in order Fashion, no, at that no, point, no, no, just no. dragging him behind on a rope. He oh, seems, his head came off on the way. Um, he seems like a man who is going to count every penny. He's not going <laughs> to waste money on a cart for a dead body. Now, after pocketing the cash from the sale, Lynch leaves town with Cowper's now empty wagon, mm. um, heading south towards Barima. As he approaches the Razorback Mountain, where he had killed Ireland and the boy, he meets the Frasers, a father and son team who are making their way towards Barima this time, with, with a cargo belonging to another chap, Samuel Bawtree. Now, Lynch takes an immediate fancy to the setup, mm. um, and from the minute he joins them, he begins plotting their deaths. The group stop at a campsite, Bargo Bush. It's a very Australian name. Bargo Bush. Bargo Bush. Um, now, there are several people already camped at this, this site, and they all have a supper together and a lovely time. Um, and then, as night falls, Lynch crawls under his wagon to get some sleep. As soon as he is out of sight, a trooper rides into camp, asking if anyone has seen a wagon that had been stolen from Thomas Culper. Okay. Um, now, whether Fraser didn't realise that the wagon Lynch was in was the one they were looking for, um, or whether they did and they were trying to protect him for some reason, we, we do not know. Um, mm. But Fraser shakes his head, says no, he knows nothing about it, and the trooper rides off. That's a lucky escape. Well, no, no but it's not, though. It's not lucky. It's God. Oh, it's but more, God. It's God. It is yet more proof to Lynch that God is truly looking out for him. First of all, the trooper <laughs> didn't see him under there, didn't see Cowper's wagon, which is just there. It's a big old wagon. It's there, and he's missed it. Is he um, doing? Is he doing like a Chief Wiggum thing, kind of like going, "Hey, yeah, we're looking for a, a white <laughs> wagon uh, that's really more of a cream, very, sort of a very buttermilk. It's, it's dark. It's dark at this time. <laughs> so. It's a bloody wagon." He now believes he is entirely invincible. Lynch claims to have consulted with the Lord that evening. Who then? The Lord speaks to him at this point um, okay. and tells him that, in light of this narrow escape, the Frasers have to be killed and their cargo taken. That is the only possible route for Lynch to go down. And now God has put this in his brain. So he feels like he's talking to God now at Apparently, this point. yes, indeed. So he gets the idea, but he thinks God has put it in his brain. Absolutely. And goes, oh, I wouldn't have thought of that I wouldn't independently. Have thought of that. Yeah. Oh, dear. Unless the oh, Lord oh dear. had visited that upon me. Now, during the night, Lynch sets his Bullock team free to run off, run off somewhere. Now, in the morning, he tells Fraser that his animals have escaped during the night. Oh, woe is me, boo. And that he is going to have to go and fetch some horses to pull this cart. He tells the father and son that, well, could you please help me hide the wagon? And they are happy to oblige. So they help him cover it with twigs and stuff like that, put some branches over it. I think not just twigs, Nick. <laughs> some, some trees. They get some trees. They put it over there. Um, just a a sprinkling of gravel and it'll be fine no one will ever see it's it it's out of the way people won't notice it and then they agree that they will take Lynch as far as they can nearer his home on the way they have to go huh. all three of them head off towards Lynch's home a day or so into their journey they stop for the evening Lynch sets Fraser's horses loose when he wakes in the morning he finds father and son panicking about their missing animals but Lynch assures them that well they couldn't have gone far they couldn't have gone far we will sort them. We will go and track them down. We will find them. Mm. He and the younger Fraser go off in search of the horses. Lynch lets the younger man lead the way into the bush. And when they are out of sight, out comes the tomahawk. Ugh. It's a very weirdly convoluted way he's doing this, isn't he? I don't know if it's quite... I mean, I think it's convoluted in the context of all of the horrible murder stories we've covered where people just go, I will just kill you with a well, tomahawk. Well, he, he's, he's doing it for a means to an end. He wants the cargo. He wants the, the goods that are on their wagon. Yeah. So he has to get them out of the way so he can take the wagon. He's just um, trying to do it as... Yeah. So this is his opportunity. Rather than a bloody kind of retribution, yeah. Mm, yeah. yeah. Lynch hides the boy's body under some wood and returns to the camp uh, with one horse. 
that they have found. Oh, okay. Um, now, the elder Fraser asks the whereabouts of his son. Lynch tells him he is still looking for the other horses. Suddenly, Lynch points out in the distance, claiming, there he is over there. He's over there. There he is. Look, and look, <laughs> oh, follow my finger oh, over no. there. Fraser turns to look where he is pointing. Lynch strikes a blow to the head, killing the man instantly. Oh, dear. It gives a whole new meaning to the phrase. Look over there! Look over there! Whack on the head. The elder Fraser is bundled up under some twigs where he hopes he will never be found. Samuel Bawtry, the chap who owned the cargo that the Frasers were transporting, yes. um, he places advertisements everywhere seeking information on his missing well, his missing employees and probably more importantly, his missing cargo. Uh, <laughs> big big picture of the cargo, then a small print, also some people. Also some chaps died as well. Or some people missing. were there, I don't, I don't know. I mean, yeah. there... Now this leads to several discoveries. This, oh. this advertisement and this sort of notice of reward if we find this stuff. The first is Thomas Cowper's cart that had been hidden at the campsite. Now finding the cart in the same campsite that had been the last place that the Frasers had been seen alive mm-hmm. sort of links the two together oh. as in the well, last thomas cowper's car we know from the other people who are at the campsite the phrases were there that evening and they also know they were with this other guy and so they now have a description so say this links them link these two fests from from cowper and bawtry together and links the four missing travelers now this does lead them to the conclusion that the phrases edmund ireland and this unnamed Ar- aboriginal boy have all been murdered done away with for the goods they the, they were transporting lynch's next step is to try and unload bawtry's cargo he's now got to, he's now got this wagon full of illegal things he's got to try and get rid of them somewhere now the, the close shave with cowper outside sydney has put him off going back into the city again do not want to do that so he decides to head back and see john mulligan the the ex-con fence who he went to originally with his eight cows so to see if he can persuade it to perhaps not offer a decent price on this new this new hall of goods. He's, he's, he's got a nice tight circle, really, he's, as of uh, contacts. He's got a few contacts, absolutely, yeah, that, he, okay, fair that he's trying to use. Again, I will go back to not the brightest bulb, as in, like, no, no cut your ties, but then I suppose he's, he's just using whatever. Well. Well, so f- we're killing everyone. Killing everyone, and God, God is protecting him. God's on so his side. Far. Is it? Well, why would you think that's going to change? I know. But this is the point. Is this not the brightest bulb? In the- he's not a criminal <laughs> genius. No, absolutely. No, no, no one's saying he is. He is no, absolutely. he's just going back to people going, oh, it's fine. God will protect me. God, God will, will protect, protect me. me. I know this person has money. It's like, really? Maybe cover your tracks better. <laughs> he's using twigs to hide a wagon, for God's sake. John Mulligan lives on a fairly isolated ranch. With his, <laughs> that never with, bodes well. With, with, not, with his wife, Bridget, um, and their two children. Yes. As Lynch rides up to the farmhouse, he sees Mrs. Mulligan sitting on a rocking chair on the porch. <laughs> a delightful image. What an image. <laughs> Lynch tells Mrs. Mulligan that he has business with her husband. He was looking to make a sale, and he was also looking to collect on a debt, he said, um, that he owed him from a, from a previous deal a number of years ago, but there was still this outstanding debt, he says. Fair now, enough. Mrs. Mulligan tells Lynch that her husband is out on the fields. He went back for hours. And don't say that. Don't he went say back for that. Hours. But he also says, well, we only have nine pounds in the house, so you're not going to get any money. Oh, for God's sake. So, yeah, you're out of luck, really. Uh, um, now, Lynch is not particularly pleased by this sort of brush off that he has received from Mrs. Mulligan. But he decides to wait until John gets back before doing anything too drastic. Did he bring his own rocking chair and they just kind of had a <laughs> rocking chair off? Well, he, <laughs> he, later, he later says, uh, being a fair man, I decided to wait until her husband returned and give him the chance to pay me my money. And if he refused, then I would see to them he would get to meet the Almighty. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> and he walks um, the distance to the Black Horse Hotel in Barima, where he purchases a bottle of rum. Yay! <laughs> I bet you it wasn't bloody white rum. I doubt no. it was, but he does not specify, <laughs> so I'm going with that. <laughs> it's just, oh, it was a lovely coconut infused white rum. Well, you wouldn't let me have if rum. you will. <laughs> He gets a nice mojito. He gets a nice bottle of rum to cool off Shush. in the hot, hot <laughs> sun. If you like pina coladas. <laughs> he was singing that all the way back to the veranda. And killing everyone you know. <laughs> <laughs> he, he believes that a bit of rum might help smooth negotiations later on. I'm just imagining him taking a swig and then bashing them over the head with a bottle. Going, that really bloody helped. Yeah, the rum helps. Really helped the negotiations. So on here, he returns to the farm and on his return, he sees Mr. and Mrs. Mulligan together on the veranda in their rocking chairs. Bloody love a rocking chair. Oh, they, they love a rocking chair. Absolutely. Who wouldn't on a veranda? 
Well, there's not a lot to do back yeah. then. There's no TV or radio. It's like, okay, should we have a go on the rocking chair for the next quite like that. six hours? Yeah, I'll get that with a bit of rum. Well, he, he's brought the rum. There's, they might have other booze in the house. <laughs> oh, they've got, they've got chartreuse in there. <laughs> They're just swilling a green chartreuse going, this is awful. <laughs> As he arrives at the house, Mrs. Mrs. Mulligan uh, runs to fetch some glasses and they all enjoy a drink. And a nice catch-up reminiscing about old times. Right. Lynch eventually brings up the matter of this this debt from Mr. Mulligan. Um, okay. And Mr. All... Mulligan asks him to be reasonable about the, about the amount. Lynch claims he owes about £30. Oh, it's a lot. Which is an awful a lot, of lot of money. Lynch leaves the veranda, goes to sit on a log, pondering what he's going to do. <laughs> Gives us uh, a log. There's a, there's a log nearby. He the, goes the, the to sit. The rocking chairs ponder. weren't good enough. No, he wants to leave them, Mr. and Mrs. Mulligan, to discuss their options. Oh, to he's, mull it over. To mull it over. Mm. He's going. He's also he's going to go and talk to God. He's going to go and talk to the Lord, have a nice conversation about what he's going to do next. It wouldn't be weird if the log was just kind of in the middle of the drive. This is weird. Why is he just sitting there shouting at God? He's at do man, I yeah. kill them? Do I kill them? Um, yep, the, the, okay, yeah, okay, good. Well, the Lord says, yep, you go for it. If they don't pay you, then you have my blessing to kill the lot of them. <laughs> Lynch burns the bodies of the Mulligan family. Oh, dear God. Did he kill the whole family? He killed then? the whole family. Father, mother, two children, a son and daughter. Son, about 16, daughter, around five. It's just really dark, isn't it? It's, a lot. It is this, not just an opportunist, as I said, not just a kind of like, yeah, just kill everyone while I can. This really crazed approach of going and sitting with them, visiting, coming mm. back, being civilised, going, talking to God, going, nope, it is God's will. I'm now going to kill all your yeah. family. You know, it makes you think that if they had handed over the £30... Would, would he have walked he, away? He left? The, the other, the Lee and Lag, they performed an entertaining <laughs> jig. They had a jolly time. They lived. They, the Mulligans had only done a jig. If they would Mulligans have lived. had done what he had asked, said, yep, here's the £30 that apparently I owe you, but fine, here's the £30. If you're useful. Would have Lynch gone on his way? Who know? We will never know. Mm. We will never know. Lynch then contacts the owner of the farm, the owner of the Mulligans farm, under the name of John Dunleavy, um, and tells him that the Mulligan family has sold him the lease. Oh. to the property and they have left they have run away now the owner seems to accept this and the locals seem to accept this as well without question um, <laughs> what did the mulligans get up to well yes. indeed I mean so what did the mulligans what uh, what happened to them that they had to leave town so quickly without oh, telling anyone so do we they... come back to the original story uh, the opening story mm. what the hell were they up to oh, with yeah. booze indeed that's that's the story that's told around town oh, that's why they bloody love those rocking chairs they were pissed the whole time <laughs> they were like let's just knock off some of this booze wow. and then just sit in the rocking chair for a while whoa it turns out the knocking off the booze was a story that John Lynch, John Dalvaney, created as an excuse for the Mulligans. That's why they Which had everyone then left. Bought. Everyone bought it. Everyone bought it. Absolutely. So, well, that's that must be true. That's why they they were quite isolated. They yeah, were out. The, I knew you were going to pick on that. Like, oh, they've got a remote farm. They've they must be into farm. some nefarious shit. Maybe they just were pissed off with everyone yeah. who was busy gossiping not, about them not necessarily they were into nefarious shit but they weren't part of the community they weren't the heart of the community so people didn't know them that well <laughs> yeah they so, would believe anything that was said so about exactly them. so with like, oh they were always a bit weird out there so <laughs> <laughs> if you got like two feet outside of the county lines oh yeah they're weird pretty much but he manages to keep up this masquerade being the legitimate new owner of this farm mm. uh, for about four or five months bloody hell yeah so he is now <laughs> comfortably settled in on the Mulligan Ranch um, he's even hired a couple of farmhands to run the farm for him while he's supposedly away on business but one day he decides that he needs another man he needs someone else to help him take produce to market he meets a man named Terence Landrigan <gasps> Really? Yes, indeed. Now, Landrigan has just finished a job, and he and Lynch hit it off really well. <laughs> However, and Lynch offers him a job. Come and work on the farm. Mm. Lots of trips to Sydney. It's very exciting for a young man. Lots of rocking chairs. Lots of rocking chairs. And oh. also, the people who lived here before, they had some weird shit in their cellar that no one really <laughs> knew about. Actually, I locked in here. However, at some point on the trip back to Burima, Lynch seems to change his mind about his new hire. Um... <laughs> Now, one theory is that Landrigan mentions to him that he has some outstanding debts, which Lynch worries that is going to bring attention to the farm, yeah. potentially. Bring attention in, and that we don't want that. Um, another theory is that Landrigan makes mention of he still has the pay from his last job, £40 in <gasps> cash 
on him. This is probably not a wise thing to admit. There is no money on his body when it is found. So no, whatever the reason, Lynch decided that Landrigan is better used to him dead than alive. As the pair make camp by the Ironstone Bridge near Barima, he clubs the man to death and conceals the body in the shrub. But Terence died with a smile he on his face. He died with a smile on his face. He did not see it coming. He was happy. He had met a nice man. He got a new job. High as a kite he High. was, everyone. <laughs> Lynch keeps the £40 payment and the dead man's hat. He crazy and also never pass up a good hat. <laughs> exactly. Never pass up a good hat. So now, as you say, we are back at the beginning. We are hey. back to the beginning. Don Dunleavy is under arrest for the murder of Terence Landrigan. Now, at this point, he is not overly concerned. He is still maintaining his innocence. They haven't figured out his real name yet. They haven't no. figured out he is Lynch. And, of course, he is still convinced that God is looking out for him. Ooh. God is going to get him out of this predicament. It does go get a bit worse, though, when the current chief constable brings in his predecessor, who immediately recognises him. Yes. Recognises John Dunleavy as John Lynch, a man who is suspected of many, many terrible, terrible things. Now, this is getting trickier for Lynch now. Um, but God will come through. God will, any minute, any God, minute, God is going to sort this out and he'll be walking out. In March 1842, he's put on trial for the murder of Landrigan. He, in fact, tries to sell some of his possessions so he can afford a lawyer. Um, but the judge blocks it, saying that, you know, you stole all this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, you have no legal right to sell it and use the proceeds. So, no. You ill-gotten gains, <laughs> yeah, literally. Yeah, indeed. So he is forced to represent himself in court. Well. He did it previously to success. But this time, who can say? He Is now... anyone going to be pissed in the stand this time? He's just <laughs> doping everyone up before they come into the court. Now, he does his best to cast doubt on witness testimony, <sighs> claiming that evidence has been planted in his house. Um, he claims Thomas's hat is his, in fact, his own. It's all my hat. It's always mm-hmm. been my hat. Mm-hmm. Though when he tries it on in court, it's much too big for him and it covers his face. Um, so, no, it's not your hat, it's is it? It's the style it's, it's of the very, time. It was the style of the time, a very big hat. Um, I'm trying to be mysterious. <laughs> on the 22nd of March, 1842, the jury find John Lynch guilty of murder. Now, the judge gives a most excellent closing statement. Oh, okay, okay. Um, which I shall read now. In an Australian accent. And not in an Australian accent. Oh, for God's sake. Because that could be horribly, horribly insulting to many people. <laughs> John Lynch, the trade in blood which has so long marked your career is at last terminated. Not by any sense of remorse or the sating of any appetite for slaughter on your part, but by the energy of a few zealous spirits. It is now credibly believed, if not actually ascertained, that no less than nine other individuals have fallen by your murderous hands. How many more have been violently ushered into another world remains unrecorded, save in the dark page of your own memory. (laughs) By your own confession, it is admitted that as late as 1835, justice was invoked on your head for a frightful murder committed in this immediate neighbourhood, your unlucky escape on that occasion has whetted your tigrin relish for human gore. (laughs) But at length you have fallen into toils from which you cannot escape. The wily cunning, the artful devices, the blustering impudence which have so long sustained you in the pursuit of a lawless life can no longer serve your turn. The sentence of the law is that you shall be taken hence to a place from whence you came, where you are to be taken to such a place on such a day as His Excellency the Governor shall appoint and be hanged by the neck till you are dead. May the Lord have mercy on your soul. (gasps) (gasps) (laughs) Everyone in the court is just like braced in their chair. Oh my God. (laughs) Oh my God. This was his moment, he was wasn't a great it? Time. Wasn't he? Just, I'm going to write all of the words, <laughs> all of them. I know it's going to be recorded. Standing up, wearing his finest robes, absolutely, dragging out every single metaphor he was that could a great possibly time. be done. That's great. More judges need yeah, to do absolutely. that. Absolutely, wetted your tigrin relish for human <laughs> gore. <laughs> I mean, I bet you everyone was like nodding along, and they went, "What? What? What did he say? You take this place, and then you will be taken to that place. Oh, it's going to be hanged, okay, and the place will be placed oh yes and there will be the having of the place and the hanging of the place and it shall be (laughs) now lynch's execution was set for the 22nd of april the day he to write it out as and forthwith it should be the 22nd of that fourth month yes it is the april the springing of the spring (laughs) 
the day before his execution, he finally realises that no higher power is coming to save him. No. He asks for the chaplain and confesses, giving yeah. details of all nine murders he has committed, wow. which are all later confirmed by police. Oh. His execution on the 22nd of April put an end to the career of a man whose nine victims make him the most deadly serial killer in Australian history. The story of John Lynch. Whoa, great story. Good story. I like that one. That is a very, very good story. Ooh, two immediate thoughts. And and this shows how your mind is warped, how one's mind is warped when you have been doing a true crime podcast for nearly 100 episodes. Only nine? Only one, Only yes. nine? <laughs> Australia's a big place, They've got surely. catching up to do. I know. <laughs> it's like, only nine. <laughs> Piddling. No great great to go to australia yeah he just sounded he sounded genuinely insane oh indeed i mean he entirely convinced that he had gone on his side yeah but not i know this is probably delving into the the nuance of how you would refer to a criminal like this so psychopathy psychopath this person is clearly just deluded and thinking god is on their side so isn't just killing people kind of in this really bloodlusty rage kind of way just thinks it's a mean to an end. Well, it is exactly. It is a means to an end. So obviously the first couple are yeah. done entirely for, well, if I kill them, I can get their cargo. I can get all their stuff on that wagon. Yeah. That's fine. Next one, I've got an empty wagon now. I've sold all that stuff. If I yeah. kill them, I get that wagon. When you get to the mulligans, yeah. um, then that's a bit more brutal because that's But it's still, a mean, it's still a means to an end. And is it just that these thoughts creep into your head and they're intrusive thoughts and before the time of mental health we all have help. intrusive thoughts we don't kill nine people but that's the point is that <laughs> is, is if you're just unstable anyway and an intrusive thought comes in and you, go, you could kill them and then you just go god god <laughs> is that you god it's me john lynch <laughs> how many cases how many cases of people who said god was telling me to do or the devil was telling me to do this mm. it was just intrusive thoughts <laughs> that they didn't quite understand because no one talked about it and everyone if, they, if you're thinking this the devil has you in its the grip devil has you absolutely well, if all you've devil. got is religion and well that's, that's it. very true if all you've got to fall back on is is religion then yeah you're you're being counseled by religion and nothing else yeah. then yeah oh it's yeah he's a curious one isn't he chap. yeah very chap. very interesting and yeah just i will make all these money making schemes yeah. and going back I, to people he knew be very interested to, to do a bit more research and finding out there must be some records about what he actually did in the uk or in ireland to be transported in the first place mm. um so i'll be very interested to try and find out what that was about yeah. um but it involved a bit more digging than i had time for unfortunately indeed indeed love the judge the love judge the is judge excellent at the end. The judge is <laughs> when i read that i thought right i'm saying all of that <laughs> it's great it's marvelous oh what a great story as i said good to go down under are there more serial killers and there more killers in australia you haven't covered because there are a few cases there that we keep meaning to go back yeah, to yeah absolutely but yeah, one of the earliest ones and the greatest one of them all in Australia. Can't well, you so. tell us, people. Are there bigger, b better, in inverted commas, gruesomer, weirder serial killers in Australia that we need to cover? What do you think? think people do you know the story of john lynch or any of the aliases that he used what a curious serial killer what do you think of his motivations behind it is it acceptable now that whatever you do or you don't do you can just go god told me to do it and god didn't say it wasn't technically wrong yeah. so i'm doing it i'm yeah. doing it yeah just drinking a gin at work god didn't say it was wrong so yeah part of my religion uh, let's all try that on monday let's give it a go let's, let's just give, give it, it a go. go let's give it a go do you know more stories from australia that you'd like to share with us please do jump on the comments of wherever you listen to this story drop us a dm if you've got suggestions and most importantly you must 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 mix up the angels draft the angels draft yeah no i like that that's going to be definitely on the rotor delicious a really nice twist on it's it's a daiquiri but slightly it better is. yeah absolutely it's a twist on a daiquiri and so. it bloody has chartreuse in it god it damn it this is, these are more awful reasons why some of you out there going are you really telling me i have to invest in a bottle of chartreuse because yep. most of the time you're going to be horrified by it <laughs> let's just not let's call a spade a spade right now and it's not cheap but still nah. it's, it's delicious it's one tick against the yellow chartreuse nick i'll give you that thanks 
but make sure that you tag us in any pictures that of cocktails you're making this weekend tell us what you are drinking what you're enjoying and anything else you would like us to mix up in future episodes and if you haven't already come and join us on patreon lots of new bonus material on there new episodes every single week and some outtakes coming up because i have a lot stored up from I was the last say, there year. must be a lot going on there there are there are lots of outtakes and it, it just takes a very long time to cut them together but i have a whole stack but you have to be a patreon member to enjoy it join see if you like it you can come back and come in and out patreon is flexible but we really appreciate your support if you do well thanks for listening guys we have been the people inside the poisoner's cabinet we will see you next week and remember your loved ones are trying to kill you Bye.